to do is the endoscopic third ventricle ostomy. And hence, during the course of this talk, I will try to focus on endoscopic third ventricle ostomy as a sort of model on which to describe this topic. The indications for intraventricular endoscopy are commonly non-communicating hydrocephalus with aqueductal stenosis, communicating hydrocephalus with meningitis, and intraventricular diseases like colloid cysts, arachnoid cysts, and tumors. Now, endoscopic third ventricle ostomy involves establishing a connection between the third ventricle and the prepontine subarachnoid space by creating fenestrations in the floor of the third ventricle. As seen in the picture on the right, the endoscope is inserted through the cortex into the lateral ventricle onwards to the third ventricle to the prepontine space bypassing the aqueduct and the fourth ventricle. This allows the flow of CSF from the third ventricle to the basal subarachnoid space by bypassing the cerebral aqueduct. It is an established treatment and alternative to sun surgeries for patients with obstructive non-communicating hydrocephalus. So as I mentioned, indications are non-communicating hydrocephalus, diagnosis and treatment of intraventricular pathologies. It is also used for choroid plexus coagulation, biopsy and removal of intraventricular and periventricular tumors, drainage or excision of colloid and carotenoid cysts, retrieval of displaced shunts. So onwards we move on to the preoperative assessment and planning. Now the preoperative assessment and planning of these patients Besides the routine neuroanesthesia assessment which is performed, which involve two parts. One is a pediatric neuroanesthesia assessment as well as specifically for endoscopic third ventriculostomy and for the pathology for which it is performed. So if it is done for hydrocephalus, it will include the assessment of a patient undergoing who has hydrocephalus. In these patients, they may be already on diuretics, so they may be dehydrated. The prolonged hospitalization or arrival into the hospital may cause dehydration. The patient may not have enough oral intake. So these patients should be pre-optimized and new volumia should be ensured. If the patient is not taking orally, an IV should be secured and the patient should be started on IV fluids. If electrolyte disturbances are present, as evidenced by a recent electrolyte report, they should be corrected prior to surgery. And if there are associated anomalies,